very warm welcome to the Johnny and Josh Show, episode 10. And looking at the lineup, it's uh, less Bo Derek and more Dudley Moore. Boys, lovely to have your company. So great to be here, Gouldy. Lots of fun. We made it to double digits. We did indeed, buddy. And I'm thinking number 10. There's some great number 10s out there in the world of sport, as you know better than most, JC. I'm thinking Johnny Wilkinson in the world of rugby. Um, I'm thinking Maradona in the world of football. Who's the best number 10 in baseball, big guy? I don't know. Dave, oh what do you got? Go you put me on the spot. I was just thinking Pele. <laughs> <laughs> say it, I want to say it in the most American way possible. Pele? Pell? <laughs> <laughs> number 10, God. Well, who's the Yankee number 10? And just leave it there. <laughs> uh, well, I think somebody's actually done some research, which rather unfortunately okay. I don't have to hand, which is <laughs> excellent. Good not the most organized of me. <laughs> we are it's actually Rusty Staub or Andre Dawson. Oh, Staub. Thank okay, you. Thank nice. you very much. Yes. Hey, we're, off to, we're off to a really good start here. This is going to be our best show yet. <laughs> well, let's continue the good start because COVID update, it looks like we may, and I don't want, I'm touching every piece of wood oh, in my study. Does. We may even get to the end of the regular season, guys, without yeah. any more postponements etc and i think mlb we've got to tip our hat they've done a great job of trying to catch up with all the missed games particularly for the cards the marlins we've got to tip our hat surely yeah absolutely i mean from the major league level we had no COVID action this week though at one of the ancillary sites for the milwaukee brewers they had two players who tested positive for COVID, which actually impacts them a little bit because it uh, limits their depth coming down the stretch run while they're still in it. But overall, I agree, Gouldy. I mean, it's uh, amazing that we've made it to the end of the season. It certainly is. And there's uh, loads to look forward to and loads to consider this week in baseball. Uh, not only, of course, that we've got the fantasy baseball update with our add on show with James Holden. Check out, I tell you what, his suitcase, his pinpoint of players that perhaps nobody knows about. It's been absolutely spot on. So check that one out, guys. That is now available on the usual sites. But here is our general news headlines of week 10. <laughs> Well, first of all, the big news, guys. Albert Pujols surpasses Willie Mays for fifth place on the career home run list. Big Dave, I know you're a massive Albert fan. Hall oh, of Fame it. shoe in surely. Well, yes. Uh, I was just trying to figure out who had the worst slide at their end of their career. <laughs> I mean, Willie had this infamous 1973 where his OPS was under 700. Meanwhile, Albert, you know, as horrific as the contract is, he does actually still contribute a little bit, perhaps not the kind of level that you want for around $29 million a year over 10 years, <laughs> roughly. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's still contributing only one year left, Angels fans. And then you're out from under one of the worst contracts in the history of baseball. Well, from hitter to pitcher, we had Alec Mills with a no-hitter at the Brewers on uh, last Sunday a week ago. Wife Page ordered a pico pizza. JC, that's the sort of way to celebrate a big day at the park. Yeah, very excited for Alec Mills. I'm going to describe him as my spirit player. Here's a guy who walked on at University of Tennessee Martin, and if you don't follow university baseball, that's not a big baseball school. He said, I can pitch at this level. He wasn't even a scholarship guy. Gets drafted in the 22nd round. No one expects anything from him. There was a great line that Tom House, who is a uh, longtime pitching coach who played at the University of Southern California with Tom Seaver, his manager, he uh, – House recently told the story about his manager, Rod Dado, who said that with Seaver, he was always before the pitch, which means he threw so many fastballs, and House was always behind the pitch, which means that he threw with such off-speed ability that hitters were way out in front, and they were behind it. That's Alec Mills, 66-mile-an-hour curveball, and all of a sudden, there he is throwing the 16th no-hitter in Cubs history. Absolutely. It's the contact. It. So easy. That's it. It's the <laughs> Even I can hit a 68 mile per hour pitch. Anyway, big week for manager go uh, the merry go round. Not just in the world of football, also it seems in the world of baseball. The very sad, really, for us UK baseball fans. Liam Carroll, uh, very surprised. Uh, the uh, team manager has uh, resigned from the job after a whole lifetime in the role. Uh, and across the pond, we've got uh, talk as well of the Ron Gardenhire, who has quit as the Tigers manager. I imagine that's uh, been painful to your heart eric it is actually sad because uh, ron gartenhar has actually stepped down at, in his, from his managerial role at in detroit but that's because he had health issues he actually had uh, severe food poisoning over a month ago and his health and he's apparently he had like numbness in his hands and his feet and he just decided you know what i need to spend time with my family and look after my health and and now lloyd mcclellan has taken over for the remainder of the season of what's left of the tiger season that is 
Well, I'm sure uh, it won't be just be Tigers fans that wish him well and uh, a well-deserved retirement. And, of course, the big news about Liam Carroll, the GB baseball manager, we will talk about that in more detail as it deserves, as he deserves. Uh, but another piece of news for this week, Shay, it ain't so. The Mets are finally bought. Big Dave, no shoeless J-Lo for the Mets, but at least they are a rodless. Thank God. I mean, we, we, I, I just want an owner that sits there and writes checks at this point. But I will say this. Mets fans, are no one's going to be uh, upset to see the Wilpons finally out of the mix here. But just because the guy uh, has the most money out of any Major League Baseball owner does not automatically guarantee success. We've seen many big spending owners. You should mention his name, Dave. Or is this like Voldemort? Steve, Steve, like Steve, Cohen, Steve Cohen of uh, financial fame, uh, or infamous financial fame, will now become the owner of the New York Mets, pending approval by uh, 29 other Major League Baseball owners. But again, beware. We saw what we see what happens in Anaheim. They spend, they spend, they spend. Nothing works. And the, another interesting uh, dynamic to this is the Mets and the Yankees now are both on kind of equal financial footing. We've never seen them really chase a free agent toe to toe. So it's going to be a different way of operating in New York going forward. That's for sure. And Steve Cohen, of course, worth 10 to $14 billion. They like to say behind every great fortune lies a great crime. I'm not suggesting that's the case. But that's my that bar mean tab good... at the club. I just wanted to know. <laughs> exactly. You mentioned the Yankees. We should, of course, reference the story last week where we were saying uh, on the basis of their recent run, they were on the verge of going sub 500. Well, I tell you what, it's the Johnny, G Johnny Gould jinx in reverse because no sooner do we mention that the Yankees are now the tankies. Well, they've gone from Yankees to tankies to spankies. They've been spanking those home runs left, right, oh and center. God. They had a 10 to 7 game, a 13 to 2 game, a 20 to 6 game, and now suddenly it's all rosy in the world of New York. Well, you have welcome. to keep in mind when you get into the playoffs, right, it's all about are you on form for a very short period of time. And if you look at the way the Yankees are playing now, I think that they're more viable to go deep into the playoffs than we ever thought. And I was saying this last week that this is a team with a lot of talent and they're a little healthier now. I don't think they have the pitching necessarily, but that offense is going to carry them a long way. Unless they a lot of swing and a miss, though. We know what happens when the real pitchers come in. A lot of swing and you, miss. You, you were naysaying the Yankees not making the playoffs last week, Davey. All right. Let's see the swing and the miss. Let's see those guys when they face real arms. Okay, right. guys. Well, we'll get into it. Absolutely. Ring that bell, Eric. Uh, that's the roundup of the news for this week. Yes. Week number 10. Okay. What's well, the end of the news round? But now it's time for Eric and the trivia. What have you got for us this week, Eric? Well, today's Eric Stumper is actually related to Albert Pujols. Or is it? Emma, is Albert Pujols a red herring? My question to you today is, which player currently has the record for most walk-off home runs in a regular season? That simple. Oh, Ichiro. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, oh, is, it, oh. is it A, Albert Pujols? Oh, boy. Is it B, David Ortiz? Is it C, Jim Tomei? Or is it D? I mean, yes, I'm throwing a D. Thank is you. it D, Ryan Zimmerman? Ooh. No Ichiro this time. So, yeah. So, is it – so, that's, it's all about walk-off home runs. Now, as good as Pujols is surpassing Willie Mays, is he, is he the one that's the current record holder of most yeah, walk-off home runs? Eric, can I be honest with you? The mere fact that Ichiro is not one of the options, I've sort of lost interest. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think even – you know, that's – No Ichiro, yeah. no question. Exactly. You can make, exactly. Let's make him E. E Ichiro. <laughs> There you go. We'll answer later on in the show. We'll chew okay. on that. Okay, well, time now for our first pitch, our lead-off batter, call it what you will. And it is, of course, uh, the story of the playoff bubble sites and schedule all been announced. The, the playoff pitcher is certainly coming cleaner. Uh, the Dodgers were the first to qualify earlier in the week. They've been joined by the White Sox, by the Rays, by the A's. So we're now getting a much clearer idea, and they will be forever blowing bubbles. And that's uh, for you <laughs> West Ham fans out there. Uh, and will this now be the new norm, JC? That's the big question. Well, let's first walk through what the actual bubble is going to look like. The wildcard games are not going to be in a bubble. They're going to be played at the 
better teams, home field, best of three, all at that field. Once we get to the division series and the championship series, we are going to be in bubbles. For the National League, the division series is going to be held at Globe Life Field in Arlington, the new Texas Rangers Park, and Minute Maid Park in Houston. The divisional series in the American League will be Petco Park for the San Diego Padres Field and Dodger Stadium, of course, in Los Angeles. The championship series will be played in Globe Life Field for the National League, and in the American League, it will be Petco. And then the World Series is going to be played at Globe Life Field. I think the big question that comes from this, and, and I think it's a great idea. I just want to drop that in there. I know David had been pushing for this for quite a bit, and he's 100% right. Obviously, Major League Baseball has made it to the most lucrative part of this whole season for them in terms of television rights, and they don't want anything to go wrong. I think that the one question you're going to see is whether we're going to have fans here. We're seeing with the NFL that they're starting to bring in a certain number of fans, and I suspect that Major League Baseball will probably allow some fans in there. The question, though, moving forward after this season is whether or not uh, this is going to be the new norm. Are we going to have these type of expanded playoffs? Because Rob Manfred did a webinar for Hofstra, a university out here, and he said, boy, I really like these playoffs. Everyone loves mm. to fill out their black bracket for the NCAA. My feeling about that is it's not going to happen. And I think the reason for that uh, is, one, the purists are going to push back, understandably, that this is not what baseball is about. You play a 162-game season, and it has to be worth something. And secondly, I actually think the Players Association, who are going to engage in collective bargaining with Major League Baseball in December of 2021, will push back. Because if all of a sudden it becomes easier to make it to the playoffs, teams are not going to spend as much money on free agents because they're going to figure they can backdoor it, have a great postseason. Season. You need to continue to create value for those players. And so I think that you're not going to see anything on the part of the Players Association being willing to have this kind of playoff system. And to be clear, JC, they have to have the agreement of the MLB Players Association for any changes of that magnitude. Yes, there's certain things uh, in terms of on field that Major League Baseball can do unilaterally as long as they give enough forward. Yeah. Warning. This is not one of them. This has to be done in agreement as part of the collective bargaining. Big Dave, let me ask you the question. Um, the World Series in Arlington, Globe, field, uh, Globe uh, Life Field, as mentioned by JC, is, is this simply because, one, we know Texas has got no hope of being there, or two, is it because Texas is a little bit more relaxed about the idea of having fans in the stadium? What's the thinking behind that? Honestly, I think it's because they have domes and relatively new modern parks. Yeah. Uh, a couple, a couple of things I want to mention. First of all, the, the, the idea that uh, not having 16 teams in the playoffs is a purist argument. I don't think we should make this about purists. I think we should just make it about common sense. You cannot play 162 games to eliminate, what is it, seven teams right now? Uh, it, it, it devalues the regular season. I think it overall devalues the product. And God forbid you have a team like the Dodgers, who have played to excellence all season long be eliminated by an eighth team that's under 500 in a three game series. I mean, that is a, I think a nightmare scenario because that can happen in baseball, Josh, as we know, I mean, it's but, possible. But wait, hold on. Here's the counter argument to that. September 30th, there are going to be eight wild card games with potential elimination implications in them. Okay. That's exciting. I mean, that's something that, that's dramatic. It's a lot of fun. Now, I get it for 162 games, but for these 60 games, certainly it's something that we should be excited about. Yes. No, look, I, it goes without saying that this year is, is fine. We can have all these experiments and we can have all this fun. And we can, as we said earlier, we can suspend disbelief. But moving forward, you, I think you run the risk of, you know, the NBA is having a lot of problems right now getting eyeballs on their product during the regular season. And, and they have a similar situation where they play a lot of games and a lot of teams make the playoffs. And Guys, I, I've got it. Dave, uh, the one thing I've got to tell you, though, in terms of mm -hmm. pure mathematical likelihood, only Pittsburgh have mathematically been extinguished from the playoff potential. They're, every other team can mathematically still make it. It's not going to happen. We know that. They're but mathematically. So even Boston and Texas, they lose once, they're out. But right now, tonight, Sunday, they're still in it. Now, Rob Manfred, the MLB commissioner, JC, he certainly seems to want to keep the expanded playoffs. Do you think that's going to be a concern for the purists and, and the likes of us that don't want it? Well, two things. One of the reasons why only one team's been mathematically eliminated is because you're only playing a 60-game schedule. If you play 162 games, if we got to this point with a week left, you'd have all the teams that were in now. So you wouldn't quite have that level of excitement. Obviously, Manfred has a lot to say about it, but as he said this week, he said, I don't 
wor I work for the owners. Uh, they don't right. work for me. So it's really going to be what ownership wants in terms of that position. But yeah. I don't expect that the players are going to uh, sort of allow for this. I did love Jerry Reinsdorf's idea for this, which is that he was going to have a slightly smaller number of teams in the wild card. But the way it was going to work was that the top teams, the teams that have won divisions, could pick which of the wild card teams they wanted to play in the first round. And I kind of like that. I mean, that's a pretty fun to have a draft for who they get to play. It's pretty exciting. So I think there are ways to maybe make this work on the margins. I, I, you know, I agree with you, Dave. I mean, ultimately, you don't want to have so many teams in the playoffs. But something in between to try and add a little excitement to it, I, I wouldn't necessarily be against it. Or, JC, or you got to figure out a way to give – uh, the champions a buy. There has to be like a reason to finish first. You know, yeah, give them a buy. Obviously, in baseball, we like to play every day. Not playing every day can be something that you you know can hinder your ball club. But in a short three game series, you take a few days off and you wait for the uh, DSs to start. To totally agree. Bob Costas made that point, the famous broadcaster who liked Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner of the White Sox idea, but wanted to make that change in order to give teams that win their division or the best in their league have a tremendous advantage in the structure. Yeah. Oh, and well, another point we have to point out, the biggest thing about the bubble is the, the, there's not going to be any off days in these series, and that's going to have a tremendous impact on pitching rotations, isn't it, Josh? Because yeah. in, in the past, you'd have a shot at, uh, in a seven-game series. You could get your ace in there for three games, and that's going to be very difficult now, isn't it? Yeah, you're going to need depth in a way that you haven't needed in postseasons previously. But that sort of goes it, – it's on message with the rest of this whole season, which is everything Absolutely. is completely different. And as it stands, uh, the Dodgers will play Cincinnati, and who wants to play Cincinnati in a three-game series with the pitching they've got? That would be a nightmare scenario for the Dodgers. Right. Anyway – so, where do I start with this? Uh, is, is, is this going to be like Interleague 2.0, by the way, with the Manfred's uh, new expanded, you know, ideas and playoffs? He's thinking about, you know, no one's actually mentioning keep the DH forever. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. You know, no. I was like, that's going to that's happen, Eric. I hate to tell you because the Players Association's on board with that because it extends the lives of players. I, I hate to say it for the purists, but you're just going to have to lump it because I would be shocked. if the I DH don't mind the DH as long as it stays in one league. And then, it, 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 you know, having the separation, one that's, that the pitcher hits, one that the batter, uh, uh, you have a DH kind of thing. Uh, and it's just, you know, now, now no, it's, it's not long interleague. It's just like, there's no National League, American League. It's all one league altogether now. Eric, I heard uh, Joe Torre speak on the radio this week, and, you know, obviously he's managed in both leagues. And he said he missed – he admitted that it was much easier to manage in the American League. And he missed the strategy of the National League game. But then he also talked about the horror of watching Chin Meng Wang rounding third, and, you know, he injured his shoulder. He was a wonderful Taiwanese pitcher, and then he was never the same after that. So there's both sides of this. Uh, personally, I'm an NL guy. I think it just kind of has to do with where you grew up watching baseball is, is, is where you take your stand naturally. Uh, I will miss the strategy of the game. I, I really like it. I like the, uh, the chess match that goes on late. All uh, right. I That's enough. I, before my, my blood boils over. Uh, moving on. We have, uh, we have more stuff to talk about, allegedly. Yeah, and uh, pitch number two, guys, is a really is sad news. Uh, and that is Justin Verlander has just announced that uh, he's going to be having Tommy John surgery. Um, so certainly out for the rest of this season, pretty much out for the rest of next season. Eight-time All-Star, World Series champion, as we know, in 2017, AL MVP, two-time AL Cy Young Award winner. Um, I'm assuming a Hall of Famer in the making. Really sad news. Your thoughts, David? Well, he... he uh... Obviously, he's had a tremendous career. We thought we were going to get more out of him this year. He started the year on the uh, IL with the uh, uh, he had groin surgery, and then he came back and he had uh, forearm issues. That's turned into Tommy John. Now he's gone. Hall of Famer. I think the thing that helps his cause is the kind of players who are really good but not Hall of Famers getting into the Hall of Fame lately. And I think you, you take that crop like your Messinas, you take your Bly Levins, and your Jack Morrises. And I think Verlander is probably as good or better than most of those guys who probably, for me, shouldn't have got in. I don't think of Messina as a Hall of Famer. I don't think of Morris as a Hall of Famer. But now that those guys are in, that precedent is set, then you have to put them in. Hard to argue with two Cy Youngs, 
and you know one of the best players of his generation no question so but what i will i he should wait if he's going to go in there shouldn't be this second he's not a second year guy he's a guy that goes in like three four five years down the line in my opinion he, sh- he shouldn't just be anointed in his second year or first year he's not on that level i think that matters yeah, I agree. He's, he's definitely not first ballot. If you go onto baseballreference.com, which is a great website, they do similarity scores where they will look at the statistics of a player and then compare it to other players to see who had the most similar careers. The two players that are closest to him who are not retired, the most closest pitcher was Zach Greinke, who's still playing. But the next two closest were Tim Hudson and Kevin Brown, two great pitchers, neither of whom will ever be Hall of Famers. If you look at his overall career war, his uh, wins above replacement, he is below the average for Hall of Fame pitcher. He's also below the average for Jaws, which is Jay Jaffe's metric for Hall of Famers. Being below average doesn't mean you shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. It just means you're not in the top 50%. The whole thing about Verlander, though, is that I feel so confident that he is not going to retire, that he is going to take this year, he's going to try and rehab, and he will be back. It'll be interesting to see what kind of free agent he is, right? Because he was basically out this whole season. He'll basically be out all next season. But his last whole season was as a Cy Young Award winner. He's coming off Tommy John. He's going to be a free agent. So what kind of money is going to be out there uh, to spend on him? Who's going to take that gamble? The first year after Tommy John surgery is tremendously difficult on a pitcher. He's going to be a guy who's going to be almost touching 40. So I don't know if he's going to come back and be as good. He may actually drop in his wins above replacement. He may have a subpar season. He had him even earlier in his career when he was healthy. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be written still for Verlander. Guys, I've got to say I'm a massive fan of Verlander. Um, One, because he's great. uh, But two, because I love an old guy proving that age isn't always the barrier. When you consider that he was an all-star on numerous occasions up until about 2013 and then seemed to be sort of in decline, as age would suggest, and yet made the all-star team 18-19, you know, was the Cy Young Award winner with a 300-strikeout season in 219. The guy's 37, 37. And the last few years, he's been pretty much the best in the business. That's got to work in his favor. That is incredible longevity. But, but here's the thing, Goldie. All pitchers who make it to the Hall of Fame at one point has made, have made an adjustment in their career. I would say not all, but the large portion come like in with, yeah, with tremendous natural talent, with so much ability, like Clemens, throw an upper 90s. And then once the velocity starts to go, they have to figure out how they go from being a thrower into being yeah. a pitcher. They all do that. So Verlander is in that mold, but that in and of itself does not make you a Hall of Famer. Can I speak as a fan for a second? You know, one thing, dislike about Verlander. A lot of talk from Verlander all the time, very outspoken. Houston Astros, sign stealing, the talk went away. Where, you know, where was the big mouth when the, when the sign stealing scandal came to light? That's a, for me, as a fan, that takes away from his achievements for me. As can, a I, fan. can I point that's, out the obvious though, Dave? He's not yeah. benefiting from the sign steals. That's not the point. He, he can chirp about all sorts of baseball issues. He can talk. He's a big mouth. He likes to talk. He likes to interject. Yeah. That's fine. That's fun. And then the, the S hits the fan on his own ground, and he, all of a sudden he's quiet. Don't like that. Okay. Well, but I have to say that at least his performance levels were, were, were pure. There's no question mark. There's no asterisk that he benefited from what they were doing, unlike the hitting lineup. That, that's my point. Okay, there goes. Well, the you know, and my the thing is, my because it's a family show, we can't talk about any videos that he made with his uh, wife. Uh, but anyways, moving on, we we have one thing I wanted to point out about Justin Verlander, and I'm a stickler for people getting to the Hall of Fame as well. But I always say, if once he hit that three thousand strikeout barrier, you're a shoe in. No, oh, not anymore. Not because anymore. Stri- strikeouts have been devalued in this generation. I think oh, right. Okay, no, that's fine. But now, but here's the, he's the last at the moment. He is the last uh, active pitcher that in our lifetime we'll probably yeah. see getting 300 games, 300 yeah. wins, I beg your pardon. Zach Greinke, potentially. Uh, but let's, let's face it, because we have also, uh, I'm just trying to think of else, it, it could potentially get to 300 in our lifetime. You know, it's not that many. Clayton Kershaw, he's at 175 at the moment. You know, he's probably the only prospect to get a 300. Not with, with right now, Verlander at 226. Don't think he'll reach 300, even if he comes back healthy, even if he has another three years. No, it's not going to happen. Let's face it. But just finishing this off, I guess he was uh, – Justin Verlander was uh, drafted in the second round, and he was the second pick. Who was drafted above him? 
Anyone know? No. His name was Matt Bush. Who? Exactly. The Texas Rangers Matt chose Bush. Matt, Bush. Matt Bush. I know Matt Bush. I know Matt Bush. Okay. Well, okay, 10 and 6. Yeah, really had an impact on the game, didn't he? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so basically the Texas Rangers could have chosen Justin Berlander first in the second round, but they chose Matt Bush instead. So who's laughing? It happens. There One you thing go. I'll say about strikeouts, just real quick before we go, Edwin Diaz is averaging 19.2 strikeouts per nine innings, so which is proof that strikeouts ain't what they used to be. There you go. All right, moving on. Okay, and I was completely unaware of Justin Verlander's acting career, but we'll have to check that out at another time. Uh, let's move on with strike number three, uh, and this one's the funny injury story. Zach Wheeler with a, a, another of these wonderful MLB freak injuries, boys, apparently caught the nail on his middle finger of his pitching hand while donning his pants. And by pants, I mean U.S. trousers uh, or U.K. trousers, U.S. pants. You've got to love that. Uh, there's been many others. Eric, what's your thoughts? Where's this in the, in the Hall of Fame of funny injuries? Oh, don't we just love it? You say it's funny, though, right? Like we, we It's tragic. Bad. Oh, it's terrible. Yes. But, it's so but it is funny. I mean, <laughs> it's come so on. Funny. It's not a serious injury. If it was a serious injury, we wouldn't jest about it. But he's I've pulled tried. a nail. He's pulled I've a tried. nail. Have you he's tried to reenact boy. that? I've tried to reenact that. I tried to figure out how that might have happened. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Well, it, 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 let's, let's face it. Whenever you, you read in the paper, a, a lot of teams don't divulge what the player's injury is when they have to put them on the – uh, injured list, formerly known as the injured reserve, formerly known as the disabled list. And for those who don't know, you can't say anymore, oh, that player's on the DL now. We've now moved on and it's now called the injured list, the IL. Uh, but my, my favorite one was uh, Joel Zamaya. Joel Zamaya, tragically, he had to go on, on the injured list, back then called the disabled list, because of a sprained wrist when he was playing Guitar Hero on Nintendo, the, the air guitar. <laughs> He was playing air guitar, and he's, he did something with his wrist while doing some Guitar Hero stuff and had to go on the injury list 15 days. And, I, uh, I still have you beat, though. I still have you beat with two better examples. One is Marty Cordova in 2002. Yeah. He was with the Orioles at the time, but had played with the Twins. He fell asleep on a tanning bed and mm. burnt his face so badly that he couldn't play in day games for a while because the doctor <laughs> felt that it was too dangerous for him, only to be beat by Steve Sparks in 1994 oh. with the Milwaukee Brewers, who wanted to show, he was a knuckleballer, so this was not a guy who was, you know, the big buff guy, who wanted to show all his teammates how strong he was by doing the ultimate strongman move of ripping a phone book. Young people, there used to be these things that had phone numbers in it, it was called a phone book, and it was thick, and tried to rip it apart, he dislocated his left shoulder. So, I mean... Those are pretty unbeatable in my mind. JC, you're killing me. Those were the two. Those exact two were the two that because I... Because they're the best. Because right. they are the best. Okay, I'm going to offer you another one. 1990, uh, Glen Allen Hill of the Blue Jays oh, went on the disabled list, as it was then known now, the aisle, in 1990, after falling through a glass table, resulting in cuts, etc. What caused the fall? You've got to love this. Hill had just woken up from a nightmare about spiders chasing him. Apparently, he's terrified of them. And in his confused state, he fell through the table. Got to love that. A big, burly baseball player, terrified of spiders. I love having to try and explain that to the team doctor. So how did you do this? Exactly. <laughs> but you another one, couple. another classic yeah, is... A couple. Oh, you got one? Well, yeah. just for Johnny, because, you know, he, his braves are not, uh, you know, absolved from these things as well. Uh, John Smoltz had to go on the disabled list because he burnt uh, himself on the iron, he was actually trying to iron a shirt while he was wearing it, and he burned his chest, and he couldn't well, follow he was wearing the chest. He, <laughs> he, 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 he iron tried to iron his, his, his shirt while he was wearing it, burned his oh, chest, and uh, and he um, and the he couldn't irony? follow through on his pitch because he, a big blister formed on uh, and uh, the irony. I like that. Yeah, the irony. Hey, oh, hey, come on, give come it to on, you. It to winner, me. winner. But you got one, you got one, David? You got one I, got a, I mean, I got a couple. So, you know, Vince Coleman got wrapped up in the tarp machine and missed the 85 World Series. Oh, I love that. Then I mean, no, it's Vince terrible, Coleman terrible. accidentally struck Dwight Gooden in the Mets locker room during that horrific year, and, he, and then Doc missed a start. Uh, what's the other famous one that I'm thinking of? You have uh, uh, George Brett uh, injuring his toe while running to the TV to go and watch Bill Buckner at bat. Uh, and the number one, Ricky Henderson... Oh, yeah. Missing the game in August because of frostbite. Yeah, 
left an I mean, ice pack on the foot the, for the, too long. The yeah. biggest takeaway from this is that it's shocking how many absurd injuries there are for Major League Baseball players. Players who have sneezed and torn oblique muscles. People who have been cleaning dishes and cut their fingers. I, I, I don't know if this is a baseball thing, but it's, uh, it's a little shocking. What about the deer meat? Clint Barnes with the deer meat in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, yep. 2005. Guys, um, it's this just as a sort of segue for this story, um, I'm, I'm big mates with a guy called Martin Bicknell. Unless you're a cricket fan, you won't remember Bickers. Brilliant cricketer, played for Surrey, um, only got four test caps, absolute disgrace. One of the greatest bowlers of his generation. And we went on skiing holiday together in 1998 when he was still a full-blown professional cricketer. Totally illegal. So he couldn't make any kind of notice, mention it to anybody, because they have very strict stipulations as professional sports sportsman what they can and cannot do which includes things like riding a motorbike not allowed mm. to do it can't yeah, go yeah. skiing and what i love is i'm assuming professional baseball has similar restraints within contracts but how do you put in restraints against some of these ridiculous injuries because it's everyday life well, but, but aaron, this is aaron boone fell jeff, off a, a, a basketball injury and he missed yeah, the whole jeff, jeff, the whole jeff kent on a motorcycle and i think madison Baumgartner too right similar type of injury there you go well one more thing that uh, Hall of Famers are, uh, and legends of the game are not, are, aren't exempt either. Even Roberto Clemente had to go on injury list because he fell off a, a hammock. <laughs> That's what I said. He was just uh, wow. fell off a hammock. The, the final one, because even though it's a family show, this has to be told. Ken Griffey Jr. had to go on the, uh, on the disabled list because he was playing somehow. I don't know why he was wearing a protective cup while playing baseball with his kids in the back garden. And uh, the protective cup actually got pinched one of his testicles and he had to go to the hospital. Is that right? Yes, cross your legs uh, when you're thinking <laughs> of that. Uh, there you go. Wearing a cup. There, and, but yeah, so there are more than, uh, there, there are just uh, a plethora of hilarious baseball injuries that got players on the table list. Very sad, very and, sad. And, and, and it's no, no laughing matter. Mm -mm. There you go. Okay, guys. Well, moving on. We're always big fans of the saves here on uh, on the on this show, and of course on the Channel Five baseball show we did all those years ago. But uh, here's a king of the saves that joins us now, and that's the football saves. The legend that is Asmir Begovic, Premier League footballer, Premier League champion, indeed, with uh, the mighty Blues that are Chelsea. Well, Asmir, for those of you who don't know, is not just an incredible goalkeeper, but he's also a massive fan of North American sport, and in particular baseball. Loves his fancy baseball and is a massive Yankees fan and I had the absolute pleasure and the honour to catch up with him earlier this week. Well, welcome everybody to the Johnny and Josh podcast add-on special and it really is special. What an absolute pleasure to welcome to the show football legend Asmir Begovic. Asmir, thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me on the show, Johnny. A legend is a very good, you know, bit of a strong word, but I'll take it. Buddy, you played for Chelsea. In my eyes, that makes you a legend regardless. <laughs> so let's talk, um, let's just rewind right back to the beginning of the story. Um, I noticed that your dad was a goalie. So I'm assuming that's where the love of goalkeeping comes from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, um, my dad was a professional goalkeeper back in the former, former Yugoslavia. Um, my grandfather was also involved in the game as a goalkeeper, not quite at the level my dad was. Uh, but my dad played at a professional level and then, and then obviously I came, I came around and um, for me, it was just a natural thing to do. You know, I, I was literally wearing gloves and uh, trying to play in goals since I, ever since I was born. And that's all I ever wanted to do and um, follow my dad's footsteps and be a professional goalkeeper. And, you know, thankfully it worked out from there. And there was never any issue of you saying, actually, dad, I want to play up front. I want to be the goal scorer. I want to be the glory boy. It was always the gloves for you. Yeah, I mean, it was never even a discussion, to be honest. Not that it was ever forced on me. It's just that's all I ever did and wanted to do. And it was never really more talked about what was the backup plan kind of thing. So, um, yeah, if I, if I chose to do something else, I'm sure my parents would have been supportive. But we never got to that. <laughs> Football was the winner as a result. Um, and obviously, <laughs> yeah. life was difficult for you guys in former Yugoslavia. Um, you, I, b I believe you moved to Germany when you were, what, four? Four. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, um, yeah, I was born in 87. And then, you know, soon after that, um, the conflict started in the, in, in, in the former Yugoslavia. And obviously that, that forced some very difficult decisions. And one of those was uh, for my parents to basically pack up all our things and, um, and get out of the country. So um, we then thankfully were taken in by Germany. We were able to settle there and um, start making a life for ourselves, which was, um, which was really good. You know, we had some really good years there. We spent six years there. 
and then we moved on to Canada at the age of 10. So, you know, it was definitely um, a pretty lively and eventful start, but, you know, th that's all part of the, the experiences I look back on now. And, and explains why your English is so fantastic. Do you speak German as well? Yeah, I speak German. Um, got that in the, in the locker as well, which is good. So, um, but yeah, I, I started speaking English at a very early age. So it's, um, it's been good. It probably explains why, uh, you know, obviously we, we met a number of years ago at a charity event and, um, and hit it off straight away. And I was hugely impressed and somewhat shocked that he was a Premier League <laughs> footballer who was not only just a wonderful guy, but also a highly intelligent individual. And that's not always the norm, but we won't go there. Um, but let's talk about Canada then. Canada, Germany. I mean, this must have had a massive impact on your, on your, on your footballing uh, ca uh, calibre. And, and, and I'm right in saying that you represented Canada as well at one stage. I did, I did, yeah. So, you know, going back, I moved to Canada when I was 10. Um, started playing, obviously, organized football in Germany at the age of, you know, five years, five years of age. Um, and like I said, that's all I ever wanted to do. So for me, it was always a nice outlet, you know, whether we lived in Germany or Canada, I was always able to play football and, and socialize with other kids and make friends. And that was always a really nice thing to have. But, um, you know, as things started to get a little bit more serious and I was going through the ranks and uh, making a little bit of noise, then... Then things started happening, and I started representing Canada at um, yeah, under, under 15 level um, and played all the way through to under 21s, under 23s even. So um, it was a really good experience, but I was never capped. So what that, what that meant was that it always left the door open for Bosnia right. to come in. It was um, the country I was born in, and um, you know, I was always able to represent them if they chose to call me up. And uh, once they did, I had to make a decision whether to continue with Canada or move over to Bosnia and um, switch my allegiances. So, you know, that's, that's what I did. You know, it was, it was a very much a family decision as well as a football decision because I thought at the time it was the, you know, the highest level of football I could play was with Bosnia. I had lots, lots better games and um, the team was in a better state. And then, of course, being able to represent my family, uh, who were mostly in Bosnia, uh, was a big factor for me. Obviously, that's the international scene, but then uh, on, on the sort of club level, it, you made your presence known in English football um, when you moved to, is it right, Portsmouth? And that was what you were playing under 18s back in 2005. What, what, how did that all come about? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, going back with the national team stuff a little bit, at 14, 15, things, things started to move a little bit. I was picked for the national teams, all the regional teams in Canada, and... Um, had a few agents of people sniffing around and calling me to, to try and represent me and then bring me over to Europe and bring me over to a higher level. And, um, you know, once I, I chose the one, one person I wanted to work with, uh, a couple of trials were set up, um, set up in, um, in England for me. One was Portsmouth. And, you know, within a couple of days of showing up, I was 16 years old. Um, they offered me a, a contract and I did my academy apprenticeship um, there and then moved into the professional ranks um, at the age of 18 in 2005, as you mentioned. And puts with them, I mean, they, they bounced you around a bit. I mean, you were on loan spells with, what, um, Macclesfield, Yeovil Town, not once but twice, Ipswich. What was that like as an experience when a sort of sense that you, you're with a club, but they don't seem to want you? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? Because, you know, the, the biggest step is when you're a young player to be able to to make, make a first team and obviously a uh, porch with the time where a, a Premier League team, so expectations are really high and they don't give too many young players a chance. And the only way you can keep developing and keep getting experience and getting better is to obviously go and play games at a good level. And that's what all those loan spells were all about. And then, you know, um, you go to one and then you get injured, it gets cut short, you go another and then you get recalled because of an injury to somebody else. So, you know, I wish there was a couple more consistent low moves for sure where I could have played extended, an extended period of time and yeah. maybe uh, things would have happened a little bit quicker. But, you know, that, that was my journey. That's part of, you know, most young players' journey. You have to go elsewhere and uh, get that experience and, and then try and prove that you're ready for the first team at your parent club. And, um, you know, that's obviously what I did eventually at Portsmouth. And obviously the big move was to Stoke City uh, and that presumably that was the fulfillment of your dreams. You were now a full-blown starting Premier League goalkeeper. I mean, how was that experience? I mean, was that everything you hoped it would be? Yeah, I mean, it, it, everything happened very quickly. I made that breakthrough uh, into the Portsmouth first team um, in 2009. And I started playing a little bit towards the back end of that, that previous season, 08-09. And then in 2009, I was able to to get that 
opportunity in um, you know in the Portsmouth first team, which allowed me to show off my uh, my skills and abilities. And and at the time, Portsmouth were in financial danger as well, and and, and difficulties, and had to sell out their assets. And January comes around, and um, you know Stoke obviously showed interest and wanted to buy me and paid. What it, what it took to get me up there. And um, as you said, it was a huge step for my career, uh, moving on you know, to a really, really good club and on to a few really successful years as well. Um, manager at Stoke at the time, was it Tony Pulis? Am I right in saying? Tony, Tony Pulis, yeah. You had an interesting relationship with him. I mean, I know you had a couple of fallings out, but he also described you as, in his mind, possibly the best goalkeeper in the world. Well, I know, I think we had a really, really great relationship. You know, I owe a lot to him. Obviously, he brought me to Stoke and um, showed that confidence and ability um, and, and in me to, to, to play. And, um, you know, was, was able to put a young goalkeeper in, which not many people do. Um, yeah. So, he had, you know, had that confidence in me right away, which was amazing. I mean, listen, we've had a couple of disagreements, as, as most players and managers and people do. And these days um everything is so well documented but that's just being in, in a professional environment and sure you know people get their signals across sometimes but ultimately you know he was he was fantastic for me he was still keeping touch today and uh, you know i have massive amount of respect for him you moved and obviously this is particularly exciting for me you moved from stoke <laughs> to chelsea um and, you know, personally at the time, I thought you were our best goalie. So it used to miss me something royal that you kept playing number two. Um, w do you look back on that with regret, the decision to move to Chelsea or not? No, um, you know, one of the uh, better decisions I made for sure. Um, you know, I was at Stoke. So ultimately being at Stoke five and a half years in the last couple of years, there's always chatter about moving on and people wanting um, to take me from Stoke and push my career on and, I felt like I achieved everything at Stoke. You know, I did a lot in five and a half years. Um, I think the team did a lot. And, you know, but ultimately I always wanted to challenge myself against the best and against um, the people at the highest level of the game. And, sure. you know, at that time, you know, when um, the Premier League champions, Chelsea and Jose Mourinho come calling to come and compete with Thibaut Courtois and win some more trophies, then for me, that was the biggest challenge. And that's where I wanted to go and wanted to be. And, you know, thankfully I had a really good couple of years there. Um, Won the Premier League um, with a bit of luck. We could have won another trophy. Um, lost in the FA Cup final, which was uh, which was a bit of a bummer. And um, you know, <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> but that's, yeah, but that's that's the, that's the that's the way it goes, you know. Um, yeah. But really, you know, to be able to win that Premier League and winning trophies is what it's all about. And had a good couple of years there. Maybe I left a little bit early, you know. But things, circumstances, you know, um, dictate themselves sometimes. But I had a really good couple of years, and will always, you know. Um, hold Chelsea in a, in a really nice place in my heart. Fantastic. I mean, you've had an amazing career when you consider, you know, you're still going strong. You're now uh, at Bournemouth, who you went on loan with uh, in your youth. So it's almost like the completion of a circle. Yeah, no, I was, oh my God, I was on loan 13 years ago, I think now. Um, so I was on loan 13 years ago. I obviously joined the club here again three years ago. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been a journey, as you said, for a long time. And uh, Still here. We've got. A, I've got a couple of years after my contract, and I'm still wanting to, um, still planning to play on for as long as I possibly can. And post career, do you think you'll stay here in Britain? I, I think so. If if you're asking me now, I, I think it's very difficult to say that because you you, you don't know when that's going to be, when that time's going to come, uh, where your opportunities post football will lie, and what will come up. But um, I, you know, I can definitely say I feel really comfortable here in the UK. I've been here now. 17 odd years my kids were born here um, met my wife here so yeah we're very comfortable here and uh, really enjoy living where we where we do well as i know from personal experience that you're also actively involved in a lot of charity work outside of football you've got your own foundation can you tell us a bit about that yeah so the asma beggarage foundation we launched that about about seven years ago um which was um aimed at building sports facilities for kids in bosnia and here in the uk um I think it's sports is a great way to reach a lot of people, present opportunities. You know, I, I was able to live my dream through through football and uh, all the difficult times I had in my life were, you know, made better by the fact that I was able to play football and uh, achieve my dreams and follow my dreams. So we're going to try and do the same. I think sports facility is great for kids to be active and socialize as well. So get them off the streets. So there's many different positives and uh, reasons as to why we do what we do but um, it's been going well obviously COVID and everything has slowed down sure. you know things for everybody but um, you know we're looking to a really bright future 
Well, buddy, the obvious segue here is you're building sports facilities through the foundation. Are you going to be building some diamonds? Because it goes without <laughs> saying, that's what we need yeah. in the UK, yeah. big guy. Well, let's do it. If, if you find a location, let's do it. You know, the more, the better. So, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, that brings us nicely and neatly to the whole world of baseball. That's what the podcast is about. And, and obviously, the first time we met, which, if I remember right, it was about five years ago uh, at, a, at a function for the uh, yeah. Alder Hay Hospital, if you remember. Amazing night that was, raising unbelievable sums of money. And, and we, f we chatted at the bar, and I couldn't believe it. You were a massive baseball fan. Just tell us about how you got into baseball. Well, I, I got into baseball, I mean, and, and obviously living in Canada. I mean, I'm a, I was, I'm a sports nut. I um, followed and played every sport when I was younger, um, you know, from, from football to basketball to baseball to tennis to table tennis, whatever whatever it was, I was I was involved in it. So still now, absolute sports nut, which drives my wife up the wall <laughs> uh, a, lot, a lot of times. We've all been there, now. buddy. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, living in Canada, listen, baseball was, was quite big. And, you know, uh, with the Blue Jays and the Expos at the time being involved in the MLB, you were getting quite a lot of games. And uh, But the one, my favorite player at the time, um, Derek Jeter, I liked Alex Rodriguez, and those guys uh, ended up being a Yankees fan. But that's what I was going to ask. You're living in Canada, so presumably yeah. you've got to be either a Blue Jay or an Expo before they went under, of course. But you're not. You're yeah. a Yankees fan. <laughs> no, yeah. So that was, was all just so, about right? the love of the individual, was it? <laughs> Yeah, you would. Yeah, you you would have thought I would have been a Jays fan um, or an Expos fan, but no, it was about those individuals. Something I liked about those guys. I think they were they were obviously great players, and um, yeah, that's what drew me to the pinstripes. Well, I, I interviewed Derek Jeter at uh, the 2008 All-Star Game. Uh, it was the last question at the, the press ju junket that they have. Um, and, and I asked him a question which upset him so much, he, he completely lost the plot. His veins were popping out of his, out of his neck and he walked off in a half. Um, well, and, what, did, what did you say to him? I, well, I, it was a little controversial, admittedly. I said to him <laughs> in my best Prince Charles voice, as mayor, trying to be as English as possible. Hello, uh, Derek. My name's Johnny Gould. I present Channel 5 Baseball in the UK. A great pleasure to meet you. I said, just one very quick question. In the UK, if you're not a Yankees fan, the Yankees are referred to as the evil empire. I just wondered if you understood why that was. Uh, at which point he said, are you calling us evil? And that was it. He was yeah. gone. Um, and I stood there thinking... I hope the camera's running because this is great TV, but I've just annoyed one of the greatest baseball players of the modern era, who for all accounts is a lovely, lovely human being. So I didn't feel very proud of myself, if I'm honest with you. Hey, you live and learn. Uh, but at least you got to meet Derek Jeter, so that was Absolutely, cool. absolutely. Did you, did you get across? Have you been to Yan the old Yankee Stadium or the new one? Yeah, no, I, I never, never went to the old one. I've been to the new one um, numerous, numerous times now. I love, I love New York as a city in general, so I try and get yeah. over there. You know, as often as I can, and of course, anytime you're you're in town, you try and get a catch a Yankees game, and um, you know, it's it's always a pleasure when I go there, and absolutely have a blast every time. And your thoughts on on what's happening this season? Because I mean, everybody preseason say they're odds on hot favorites, definitely making the World Series. It's them and the Dodgers. And yet, if I'd been speaking to you a couple of weeks back, they were on the verge of going sub 500. They had such a bad run. Well, you know, you've been asking me for two, three weeks to come on, and I've been deliberately <laughs> waiting for the Yankees to turn it around a little bit. <laughs> so I wouldn't be taking the Vic, obviously. Yeah, yeah no, otherwise it would have been a really uh, different conversation. But, no, listen, I, I think overall when you look at it, um, you know, the Yankees roster is, is stacked all over. Um, it's World Series or bust. Um, and that, but that's generally the Yankees' sort of expectation. And now the guys are starting to become healthier, and uh, the lineup is looking – what everyone expected it to look like. And um, yeah, if you can have Garrett Coley in that rotation, then of course it gives you a chance every year. So Absolutely. hopefully this momentum is coming at the right time and takes them into the playoffs and hopefully with a really deep playoff run. What's your thoughts about all the changes in the in the COVID season, this abbreviated season, particularly things like the universal DH and the, the, um, the sort of seven inning restriction for double headers, et cetera, et cetera? Well, you know, if you're going to experiment with the game, um, this is the year to do it because, you know, everyone's thinking on their feet and you have to make quick decisions and try and be as proactive as possible. And now, there's a couple of things I like. I don't, I don't mind the universal DH. I really don't think, you know, it's fair on pitchers. Like, like you know, it isn't football goalkeepers taking penalties. You know, that's not what we get paid to do. Um, but I, 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 don't like, I don't like pitchers hitting. So I, I think the DH is a really good thing i think actually extra innings uh, the runner in second i think listen i think that's positive you know 
as much as I love baseball, but, you know, watching games, 17, 18 innings is just a bit too much at times. So there's a couple of things I like, and I think that, that modernizes the game. But at the same time, Johnny, also what drives me a little bit up the wall is people trying to change the game too much. You know, yeah, baseball is – it's been a great game for so many years. Um, you know, it's not about saying you either love it or hate it, but it's it's a great game. And if people, you know, more people get into it, the better, of course. But there's a couple of things I like, and uh, I think there's a couple of things that could really stick going forward. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't make all these drastic changes that everyone's talking about. And, um, you know, we still need to try and keep the game as, as whole as we can. Well, you're going to find some big friends amongst the show, Josh and, and Dave and, and Eric. We'll, we'll love to hear what you've got to say. Yeah, um, you need change, but you also need to respect the traditions of the sport. And that's obviously a key part of why we guys all love baseball. Do you play fancy baseball? You know, not, not this year. Um, I have usually gotten involved, but this year um, I thought it was going to be so difficult to, to keep up with everything and uh, all these changes and COVID uh, um ILs and everything else so I haven't this year but how's your team doing well very kind of you to ask but I'm actually uh, top of the table buddy I've uh, been in this right. league for 15 years and I've never won it but I've got what 10 days to go and uh, it's squeaky bum time well, it, it's me. funny I, I I don't know if my maybe my emails are broken but I didn't I've never got an invite so <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I would have been involved if you know well, other people reached out to me it's very interesting to say that because we're actually doing a fancy baseball uh, podcast add-on to the Johnny and Josh show uh, with James Holden, who if, seriously is the greatest fancy baseball player I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. And he's like our expert, resident expert. And he wants next season for us to do next season, hopefully a normal season, to actually have a league that we invite our listeners to join. And if you would be our superstar guest that everybody could yeah. look to try and beat, that would just be awesome. Yeah, that could, that could very well be on the cards, I have to say. Fantastic. Well, my people will speak with your people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how has COVID? I mean, obviously, you know, I've, I've actually been really impressed with the way MLB's dealt with the, the, the COVID problem, especially with the, you know, the, um, uh, the Marlins going down quite seriously, the Cards losing all those games. We're going to have an uneven schedule almost inevitably because of it. But I have to say, I think they've been very proactive and dynamic in the way they've dealt with it. How's, how's your experience as a professional footballer? You've just come back from being on loan at um is it ac milan yeah yeah no i have to say listen um i have to say general sport i think has done a great job you know um some leagues were a little bit quicker than others but i think everyone's put an amazing product on i mean the nfl has just come back as well and the nba is doing a good thing and i think the mlb has done as good of a job as they possibly could have i mean you're going to have speed bumps Along the way, um, it's about adapting. 2020 is the year of adapting and being, <laughs> being um, you know, accessible to change and being, uh, sure. being able to kind of think on your feet a little bit. So it's, it's definitely wasn't going to be without its hiccups, that's for sure. Um, and early on, they, they certainly were. But I think now it's, it's great. It's just great to have baseball on TV and um, these guys playing. And we're looking forward to the playoffs. So I guess it's going to be like bubble playoffs, which is going to be a lot of fun, I think, as well. And, and um, yeah, it's going to be you know, a well-deserved champion whoever gets it because of dealing with all of these different sets of circumstances is not easy. So, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch the next few weeks play out. I know you're doing your own podcast. I've been watching Season of Sports. Is that still happening? Hey, you know, it, it certainly is. You know, we had a really good summer with a lot of episodes. I'm just taking a little bit of a break at the moment because of the season kicking off and my time being so limited with all these games coming thick and fast. So I'm definitely going to try and get a lot more episodes out during this uh, season once um, things settle down a little bit. But yeah, maybe I'm going to have to get you on my, my podcast now. In a, oh, my well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely uh, give uh, your podcast a reference on, on the show. So uh, we'll, we'll drive the 43 people that are listening to us your way um, in Love return it. for the multi-millions that are no doubt listening to your own good show. <laughs> Just to wrap things up, Esme, I know you're a very busy man and I'm so grateful for you taking time to speak with us. Um, what about the, 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 the postseason? What's your thoughts? Any predictions? Who do you think is going all the way? Well, I had... Um... You know, I know it sounds maybe a bit of a boring prediction, but I had the Yankees-Dodgers World Series. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll stick with that, even though the, the Dodgers are a little bit, I think, ahead of schedule here. Um, or ahead of the Yankees, certainly. So I'll stick with that. But um, listen, uh, the White Sox are making some noise. Um, Can't agree they're, more. They're, Absolutely, yep. And in the National League, well. any thoughts of a potential outsider? Yeah, well, listen, I think the Padres have given it a good go. Um, they've certainly been, been active in the deadline and, 
and made a few moves. I think the Cubs are looking okay. Javi Baez was, was alive and well last night. So um, interesting to see what happens there. But I think the Dodgers are they're looking a pretty safe pick um, at this moment in time to get to them to the World Series. But the Yankees, I think, are going to have a little bit of a tougher road. So, so you, like me, do you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is just go and see what happened last night? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I watched that, what happened last night. I check out my Yankee reports, see how many home runs we hit the night before. And then, um, you know, check out the rest of the scores, listen to a bit of podcasts, uh, get some information, and um, try and keep on top of this as much as I can. Love it. Absolutely love it. And the thought of taking you on at Fancy Baseball, that would be an absolute joy. Asmir, thank you so much for giving up your time. We're so grateful to you, all of us on the Johnny and Josh Show. And, buddy, very best of luck with the rest of the season. Thank you so much, Johnny. Appreciate uh, you having me on, and uh, good luck with everything. Cheers, buddy. Take good care. Well, guys, there you have it. Asmir Begovic, uh, not just a legendary goalkeeper, but a legendary guy. He's such a nice bloke and an incredibly bright guy, speaks three languages and really knows his baseball, JC. I mean, his tips. I mean, everybody's saying Yankees, Dodgers, but he then goes on and says that, you know, the possible upsets, he's thinking White Sox, he's thinking he's Padres. This man knows his baseball. Yeah, I agree. I thought he was spot on. I mean, I think that of course, we're going to say the Dodgers. I think it's hard not to. But, you know, the White Sox are a strong pick, too, with uh, Giolito and Keuchel being healthy again. And, of course, the Padres have played the Dodgers tough in the West. So uh, props to Asmir for his baseball acumen. And actually, I knew you'd love the fact, Eric, that he is a bit of a purist. He doesn't like the changes, too many changes. Although, when it comes to the DH, I loved his comment. You wouldn't ask a goalie to take the penalties. Therefore, why are you asking a pitcher to hit a baseball? That's true, even though he missed a penalty this week against uh, Crystal Palace. It's, 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 that's probably the reason why he said that. But, uh, the, uh, the thing is, yes, okay, fair enough. He, he says he's a baseball purist, but, you know, he, he didn't exactly say keep it in one league, though, did he? And he didn't say scrap interleague, and he didn't say this. and didn't say, he's, he's you know, inconsistent. <laughs> exactly. I love, I love it. Keep, keep, keep it in your one league. Just, just keep it in there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think we'll all go with that. We'll all go with that. And actually, Dave, uh, I possibly wouldn't have done the interview if I'd known he was a Yankee fan beforehand. What's that all about? He's a Yankee fan. It oh. fed us to him, not because of the organization, but he said he loved oh. A-Rod. He loved Derek yeah. Jeter. They love the people. hat. They love the hat. You know, it's all about <laughs> the stripes. <laughs> you know, go around London. You never see a Mets hat. It's all Yankee. Well, he's doing his own podcast, guys, um, which we mentioned in the interview. Uh, and I have to say, season of sports. He talks about all sports on his podcast. So I promised him I'd give that a mention again. So uh, for those of you listeners out there that love your sports podcast, give Asmir's a listen. Season of sports. Top man, Asmir Begovic. How cool was that, guys? Very. Very. We, yeah. we, we, we love our footballers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And fingers crossed we'll get a few more. Right. Time for seventh inning stretch. <laughs> There we go. I don't, it's how ridiculous do we all look? There we go. Um, we were all stretching our arms for people listening at home. <laughs> exactly. You heard all the creaking or echoing the across different <laughs> yeah. cities. I yeah. think I pulled a muscle. I'm a former baseball player. I, I, am on the, the, yeah, but I think arts. also this is the first week where Dave's sweat yeah. marks weren't showing. It was only mine because I'm in my caution rugby T-shirts because I'm fresh off the training field. Ouch. There you go. Digression. Now. Where's the waffle? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like it's, it's, well, we're it using waffle. it's been a while oh, since okay. you had to use a waffle, actually. Eric is holding a waffle. I'm holding Eric up a waffle, out. ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those who are listening in, which I wield and present to the guys on camera when they start waffling too much. But although I've been accused of it myself, you're waffling right now. There exactly. Exactly. Get on now, where's it. my waffle? I need a <laughs> waffle. The baseball book of the week time. Here we go. Uh, this week, I thought I'd be a bit more sophisticated because I'm, you know, obviously I do hang around with a bunch of riffraff once a week here. And so to, I, I'll even be putting on spectacles for this, for Ooh, this segment. You're so sophisticated. And discuss, uh, because I'm so sophisticated, there's a book called Baseball Haiku. Ooh, That's ooh. right, baseball haiku. See, why didn't like you do that. Roger Angel this week? He turned a hundred this week. Ah, uh, you get to see a spoiler alert. There we go. Wow. Okay. Well, He's not predicting. Uh, okay, now, now everybody's going to know he turned 100. Okay, so, like, so, he, so it, now my, my nice, tidy sentence that was going to take us from haiku and then waxing lyrical or Roger Angel. Uh, Is it okay, Angel so, or Angel? Angel. How do you pronounce it? I always pronounce it Angel. 
I, 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 with a David, Le David Lynch L. Um, <laughs> not to be confused with Roger Kahn, but yes, Roger Angel or Angel, whichever which uh, he turned 100 this week. One of, the only problem is I don't actually own one of his books here in the United Kingdom. They're all still in Canada. Uh, so that's why I decided to go baseball haiku. In and mom's condo. In my mom's uh, the basement of my parents' <laughs> condo in Montreal. Now, on, uh, on island? Entered on by, okay, island? so basically yeah. it's entered by Cor Van uh, Den Heuvel and Nane Tamura. Now, haiku, as you know, is like a Japanese prose, as, as we want to call it. And I, if, if, if I may, if I may read you some haiku, because it basically, please, please. It, it, it's uh, rained out, the coos of pigeons echo in the empty stadium. You see, all oh, people do you, say. Do you know people, the syllable breakdowns? For people, haiku? people think. Yeah, people think that that you know, haiku is sophisticated, and other people think it's absolutely pretentious claptrap. Yes, uh, uh, but well, no, well, tell, tell us, tell us the syllables that you need on each line. You got to know uh, four this. syllables in the first. Okay. Seven in the second. Three in. <laughs> <laughs> I had to count in my head. Three <laughs> last. Uh, yeah, but yes, but haiku. You know, basically, if you, if you ever want to, you know, get your kids into poetry or haiku and mix it with baseball, there you go. Last day of school, the crack of the baseball bat. Through Isn't it amazing, guys? Isn't it I finish this haiku before I finish. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you had Right mid haiku, you interrupt me. There's only three <laughs> three right, lines. Just you crushed this haiku. haiku. The last day of high. The last day of school, the crack of a baseball bat through an open window. That you see how fast was that? Okay, so basically, I mean, that's yeah, baseball. Wisdom. Like, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. There you go. Exactly. You, you can't. You can't buy that. Well, you can buy this, but you can't no, buy wisdom. There you I, go. I have a haiku, a baseball haiku that go I on. that I created with the help of the haiku generator for a live blog during the World Series last year. Zach Grinky was on the mound. I'll read it to you now. Go on. Fast autumn, a high checkered fastball runs in spite of the Grinky. Ooh, that's what the. Auto generated haiku machine made for me when I plugged in autumn fastball and grinky. So pretty good. Not bad, not bad. Good. There we go. Yeah. So, so, ladies and so gentlemen, you could write a book. Just use the. Use the yeah, I don't yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to get your children or yourself into haiku, I recommend Baseball Haiku as the baseball book of the week. Moving on, we're talking about uh, baseball films. Or actually, you know, this week I just thought because I, I, I caught it glancing, clicking channels the other day, Neil Simon's The Odd Couple. Walter Ooh. Matthau, Jack Lemmon. It's a classic. If you haven't seen it yet, what's wrong with you? Come on. It, it's, it's one of the classic films of all time. Call yourself uh, a movie fan, people? And seriously, what do, you, what do you mean you've never seen The Odd Couple, yeah, 1968, with Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon? I must say, and the one, there's one scene in it in particular, because Walter Matthau plays Oscar, Mad Oscar Madison, who um, who is a baseball writer and, uh, and is a New York Mets fan, always wears a New York Mets cap. Uh, and there's a scene where he's at Shea Stadium and Felix Unger, who's the neat freak, um, calls him up at, in a press box at Shea Stadium. And while he gets up to go on the phone and tur he turns his back to the field, the Mets have a triple play. They, 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 he, miss he just misses a triple play and he, and he starts yelling down the phone at uh, Jack Lemmon, what's the matter with you? I just missed a triple play. Uh, but there's a backstory to that triple play. The they, they, the 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 that was actually game footage, kind of. They they actually wanted you know, a full Shea Stadium, so they got Walter Matthau in the press box, and they actually they didn't want to like, you know do a green screen or anything like that. They actually wanted stuff happening in the background while he has his back turned to the field while he's on the phone with Jack Lemmon, and they, it was actually a game between the Mets and the Pirates, and so what happened was that Major League Baseball and the New York Mets allowed them 35 minutes of filming prior to the game beginning. Oh, oh, so, they, so they orchestrated both teams, the Pirates and, the, this is 1967, the Pirates and the Mets. Listen, guys, we want you to, to, to we're just going to put you on the field. We'll put a, a runner on each base, and we want you to hit to a, to a, to a triple play. And they went up to Roberto Clemente and offered him $100. Listen, here, if you, if you don't mind, You'd just be a speck on the screen anyway, but can you hit into a triple play? And he goes, I never hit into triple plays That's and refused. Right. And then Bill Mazeroski said, I'll do it. <laughs> so he took the hundred bucks, hit into a triple play. They took two takes to get it right. 
And so if you ever, we'll post it on one of our social handles, uh, the triple play that Walter Matthau misses in The Odd Couple. And it's, and it, it just forget the baseball reference. It's just a gem of a film. Great story. Great story. Yeah. Great story. I knew, I mean, I remember the scene in the movie, but I uh, didn't know the backstory. Of course, it became a really popular television series in the U.S. with Jack Klugman and Tony Randall as well. Moving on to our TV reference uh, segment, and it's, ah. the, it's the Odd Couple. <laughs> Oh, well, which, is, segue. Which, oh, tiny segue. which is a which is a great uh, segue from from film into te to television. Yeah, that's a good idea, Eric. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I was the only way, one. Way to do the legwork, Eric. Way to work hard this week. Excellent. So, anyways, uh, Maybe I just we'll sweep them. Now, as classic as a film, The Odd Couple was from 1970 to 1975. Jack Klugman, aka Quincy, MD, uh, played Al Oscar Madison. Uh, also donning a New York Mets cap during the entire show, and Tony Randall playing Jack Lemmon's role of Felix Unger, and people say, "Oh, how can they do that?" You know, the, no one could do it better than Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. And I'll tell you what, Jack Klugman and and uh, Tony Randall do a a great job on their own. Right. Uh, and uh, but did you know? Mm -hmm. No one knows about this, but there's recently been a remake on TV of The Odd Couple, and Matthew Perry plays. Oscar Madison. No. Right? Yeah. What, what, what's the baseball connection for the TV series? Just that he was a... Wait, 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 wait. Uh, Matt Harvey has a, a cameo in okay. the new one. Uh, but, but it's the odd couple. It came on 2015, got canceled in 2017. Um, and no one's ever heard of it. So poor Martin, Matt Harvey does his cameo with Matt per Matthew Perry of Friends fame on a show that no one's ever, uh, no one's ever seen, let alone even knew about. I mean, but going back to the 1970s classic, the best one is Howard Cassell, legendary, um, drunk, <laughs> legendary toupee <laughs> wearer, wearing broadcaster for ABC. He has a cameo on the show. And actually, Howard Cassell, uh, as a baseball slash sports commentator, is a pretty good actor. He actually does a pretty good job in an episode of uh, of the odd couple you know, from the 70s. Um, so, well, another thing we'll be posting. So, yes. More, th more things to talk about at a later time. But moving on. Because now so we, we, we can't talk about Quincy? That was well, a great show. I, never I love that Quincy. show. Quincy was all right. I mean, I mean, no, uh, give me more Columbo. I was more Columbo than Quincy anyway. So. You love Columbo. Yeah. Oh. And by the way, uh, this is, uh, speaking of our couple, uh, there was a uh, there you would never see a more fitting uh, duo that looks like Oscar Madison and Felix Unger than... Johnny Gould and Eric Jansen sharing hotel rooms when we're on the road. Oh, I'm telling you what, the, Johnny. The, the I'll give Johnny. Is... I'll give Johnny his credit. He is his. He packs his suitcase meticulously. Is that right? Like really? each sock is like with a ruler. He folds it in half and the thirds, and and I just dump all my underwear on top of my camera equipment. What a and I'm surprised that anybody who borrows my camera afterwards doesn't get pink eye from using the viewfinder kind of thing. But, uh, oh my God. But, uh, sorry, so family show. You, you, you both snore. You both snore. We both snore, but, uh, but yeah, we? it's... Uh, Do we, Eric? Do we? Um, I never hear you snore. Do you hear me? No, snore? no. Exactly. Exactly. The amount of pillows going from one bed to the other to try and shut each other. Those aren't pillows. <laughs> Those are pillows. There we go. Uh, yeah, moving on, <laughs> because it's time to see again the uh, the, the dumb factor uh, with the, with our podcast members here. Uh, earlier on the sh show, I asked you who currently owns the record for most career walk off home runs. Is it A. Albert Pujols? Is it B. Jim Tomey? Is it C. David Ortiz? Or is it D. Ryan Zimmerman? Gentlemen, who's going to go first? I'll go first. I'll go first. I'm working on, uh, I have no clue, which won't surprise anyone. I'm going on the basic of my logic, which is you throw in three superstars and one also ran. It's bound to be the one that you least expect, which is why I'm going D, Ryan Zimmerman. He was, yeah, I, it is. I'm almost certain it's Ryan Zimmerman too. I remember that he was at least close to the record around it. So I'm actually going with Gouldy on this one. Yay, JC. Yeah. N no way. It's Pujols. Of course. Because he, else. because he, because he's because he surpassed Willie Mays, and that's why I did it to well, be lateral yes. and to be. Yeah. Is, you're, like, you're like Bassini in the Princess Bride. Yeah. <laughs> Inconceivable. <laughs> now, um, here we go. The answers are okay. So, um, David Ortiz hit 11. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Albert Pujols hit 
12. Okay. Um, Jim Tomei hit 13. Come on, Ryan! Ryan Zerbin hit... Three. 11. Ah! <laughs> Tomei! Yeah. Jim Tomei hit 13. I remember Zerbin was close. I guess he never got there. So now, he, so now however, Ryan Zerbin is still active. Albert Pujols nah, still active. Well, well kind of. Yeah, not, not retired. Not yeah. retired. He still has a chance to surpass the, the Jim Tomei 13. So does Albert Pujols. He's one away from tying. So, uh, as a time of recording, Albert Hall has 12, Ryan Zimmerman has 11, Jim Tomei still has a record of 13. So, it's not impossible to be broken. So, in terms of Eric's stomper, we're, we're not even hitting in the Mendoza line. The three of us are useless. No, uh, I, think, I, I think I've gotten two. I think I'm two for 10. Do we have standing? Right, the Mendoza line. <laughs> no, you, know, you don't want to see standings. Anyways, <laughs> moving on, because Johnny, the postman always rings twice. It certainly does, guys. Um, and we've been having loads from everybody on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, don't forget, guys, uh, the, for the, those of you out there that want to get in touch via Facebook, the Johnny and Josh Show. And on Twitter, it's at Johnny and Josh. Um, I'm going to try and get some different names in. Uh, we always hear from some great individuals. And we absolutely love the fact that you get in touch. But I'm going to give Clive Barker a mention, first of all, from Facebook. Given the way the season's gone so far, guys, with some scores resembling NFL scores at times, well, plus the whole concept of the expanded playoffs, do you think it's possible? A team might make the playoffs with a losing record, and if they do, will that devalue the World Series? I know we've touched on this, but the question is asked at the end: Does it devalue the World Series? And I want your view on that, Dave. Uh, this year, perhaps not. But if that, well, I, I do think it's kind of a joke if a losing team defeats a one seed that that you know has an outstanding record. That is kind of an illegitimate point. But again, we're suspending disbelief. Uh, in the long term, I it went on over a 162 game season. That would probably going to be similar. It wouldn't devalue it because why are we letting these guys in over if 162 games? That's kind of a joke. Yeah. Yeah. For for 60 games, though, forget about it. You know, the Nationals who aren't going to make the playoffs to the same record now that they had last year, and they won the World Series last year. It just is reflective of such a small sample size, not meaning anything. So I feel this year. Just have fun with it. We got to stop worrying about the purest perspective for this season. 162 games, valid argument this season. If you're under 500 and you make a run, tip your hat. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mary Ann Caho, MK, as I like to call her. She's a big uh, Atlanta Braves fan. Um, I've been in touch with Mary Ann for many, many years. She's a massive Atlanta fan. In your opinion, why hasn't Dale Murphy been elected into the Hall of Fame? He has the numbers. Is it politics that he hasn't got in? JC, uh, I imagine this is, he's a former Brave. What's your thoughts? Is there a political issue here? No, I mean, I love Dale Murphy, and he's a great human being. If there were any political issue, it would be the other way, which is that everyone loves him. He's so beloved that they would push him into the Hall of Fame because of that. He just says, you know, he had the back-to-back -back MVPs. He had a fantastic sort of seven-year peak. But if you look at the career, he fell off so much at the end of his career that the overall numbers just don't merit it. I love him, though. Yeah, do you know, talk about a clean living guy. He, he wouldn't drink at all alcoholic beverages and he wouldn't allow women to be photographed embracing him. Can you believe that? He paid his teammates dinner checks as long as there wasn't alcohol involved. So, I mean, he was a clean living, lovely, lovely although, man. Although, you know, I was with, I've been with him in Italy uh, for one of the, uh, the Major League Baseball game development programs. One thing, he, he does have one vice. And that is gelato. He's bought so much gelato. I've never seen a man eat so much gelato as Dale Murphy. <laughs> I, so knew I, I think he should go into the Hall of Fame. Just, no good. just for that, he should go in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> well, when, when I was 12, I got front row seats right behind the dugout for a Dodgers Braves game for my 12th birthday. It was like the biggest thing ever. And I had a little Polaroid camera shows how old I am. And I, Dale Murphy's coming in from the outfield in the middle of the game, and I go, hey, Dale. He stops, and he poses for me so I could take a picture of him in the middle Aww. of the game because I was a kid, and it was my birthday. He's just a good dude. There's no doubt about it. Not a Hall of Famer, but a great dude. Okay. One more. Um, one more. Right. Uh, very quick one. Fraser Murray. Dave, does Rob Manfred care about baseball or merely the owners of MLB teams? God. You know... You'd like to, you would hope that he cares about baseball. I think sometimes he's a little misguided in the way that he goes about his job. You know, refer what was what was it the way he referred to the World Series trophy as a piece of metal, or what, what was that, Josh? He said something that like it. that, right? There, yeah, yeah. He's, I mean, that doesn't strike me as somebody over overwhelmed by passion for the game. 
Uh, I, you know, bit, he's under, look, let's not, let's be honest. The goal of the commissioner is to make as much money for the owners as possible. He works for them. That's the gig. And I think that Manfred's problem is that perhaps he doesn't hide that as well as maybe others do. Okay, before we wrap up the mailbag, JC, you've got a very specific cap on. Obviously, our listeners can't see it. And it's with regards to the outgoing GB manager, Liam Carroll. Really surprising news, the resignation after so many years at the helm. And I've just seen the most incredible outpouring of love for Liam and respect for the job that he's done. Yeah, so I'm wearing a UNLV hat, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and Liam before he became the manager for the Great Britain national team, uh, was head of baseball operations for them. So he'd had some experience at the highest level of Division One college baseball. And I just want to give, give a little bit of love to Liam, who had an aspect to him, and he's going to continue coaching. I don't want to talk about it like this is a eulogy, but he has an aspect to him that I think is so important in great coaching. When I was in college, my catching coach was a guy named Joe Keenan, and one thing that he did that was so special was that it didn't matter if you were the first string catcher or the last guy on the bench. He gave you time to help you improve as a player, and when I came in as a freshman, I was near the bottom, and he gave me time and helped me become such a better player, and that is a quality that Liam Carroll has that is so unique and so important, because a lot of coaches gravitate to the talent and spend time trying to cultivate the talent instead of seeing that there are people who may not look like their players who you put the time in for and Liam has done that throughout his career as the GB manager not just at the national level but going to various uh, teams across the country and doing that kind of work and it's going to be a huge loss to Great Britain baseball not just at the top level but all the way through he's being replaced by a, a gentleman by the name of Drew Spencer who is an enthusiastic, incredibly smart individual, played four years of baseball at Dartmouth College, a very good player who brings a lot of baseball knowledge. And what I like about that choice is that Drew is based in the UK. He's based in London. He's been the manager of the London Mets team. And so you're going to have someone on, you know, in location and in the right place uh, to help continue to develop baseball, not just at the national level, but at the grassroots level. Brilliant stuff. We wish Liam all the very best from all of us here on the show and for, on behalf of all GB Baseball fans. Um, he will uh, obviously uh, leaves massive shoes to fill, but we and wish him the very best with everything. Two things I want to say about Liam as well. Uh, I've, I've also traveled extensively with him around Europe uh, from these Major League Baseball game development programs. Uh, he's, yeah, he is a fantastic uh, leader on the team as far as a coach and, um, and, and nurturing uh, the talent uh, of players, but also he's, I've never seen anybody drink so much coffee and pepperoni pizza in one sitting. So just he on that pepperoni basis, pizza? Drink, That's drink, amazing. drink so much coffee and eat so much pepperoni pizza that on that basis alone, he should go to the hall of fame. There you go. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, well, that's the mailbag for the week. Thanks for getting in touch. And don't forget, if you want to contact the show, and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a question for the top, for the boys or whether it's you want to highlight something that's going on in your world of baseball here in the in the United Kingdom, then please do get in touch. Our social handles on Facebook, The Johnny and Josh Show. Do subscribe. We do want to get those numbers up, get the likes up so that we can, uh, we can make sure that we're out there and reaching everybody in the world of baseball. And on Instagram and Twitter, it's at Johnny and Josh. Uh, but thank you for everybody that got in touch. I'm sorry I can't get everybody a mention in. Don't forget the fantasy baseball add-on, James Holden, with all the latest. We've got one more week to go. I don't want to mention it, guys, but right now I'm looking at a potential double championship, but we're not going there because that's going to jinx it. I'm not going to mention it, but thank you to JC, to Big Dave, to Eric. Anything you want to add, boys? Good yes, luck. I do, actually. I want to say that uh, we, we forgot to wish uh, David a, a belated happy birthday. Oh, oh yes. it was this week. It was this week. Very oh. baby boy. Yeah. I you thought we asked, forget. Yeah. I think someone asked whether you or I was older, and I was very flattered that I could even be in the same range of age as you. Yeah, that was Edward Dunch. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, actually yeah. did say, since we've got so many, uh, he said, which is older? And I loved his comment. He said, I presume David's mustache has its own birthday. It does, <laughs> and a social security number. <laughs> and postal code. Got, got to collect taxes off the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> and Facebook account. There must be an appreciation society going somewhere for well, Big Dave's mustache. Thank Fantastic. you. Happy birthday, buddy. Did you Good. do anything nice? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no curling matches? No, didn't curling. Go. Hey, how did you get on with the curling, JC? Yeah, we did. We made a real good run, made it to the semifinals, finished in the money. The only team we lost to was the team that won it all. It's the number two team in the U.S. There you so go. You finished in the money? How much? A high three-figure sum. 
Ooh. Loving that. Excellent. Loving that. <laughs> Professional curling. It's got nothing to do with the baseball. Who cares? This is the Johnny. <laughs> Boys, you're total legends. Thank you for joining us yet again. To each and every one of you out there, thank you for listening in. This is the Johnny and Josh Show. Enjoy the last week of the regular COVID season. We'll be back next time in the same place. Till then, bye bye. <laughs>